Today, I'm going to give you a qualitative introduction to resonance. And the idea with resonance is if I have something that oscillates, what happens when I drive that oscillator? For example, what if I have a pendulum, and you'll notice in this simulation, the pivot point at the top of the pendulum is moving back and forth. So we're driving the pendulum. And if that pivot point moves back and forth sinusoidally at the right frequency, with just a little bit of motion of the drive, we can get a very big amplitude motion for the pendulum. Or similarly, here I have a simulation of a mass on a spring, and you can see the top of the spring, where it's mounted, is moving up and down sinusoidally, but with a very small amplitude. But because we are driving at the resonance frequency of the mass spring system, the mass actually gets moving quite a lot at a very large amplitude. This all comes down to pushing at the right time, right? Imagine you're pushing your niece or nephew in a swing. You know that with little pushes at the right time, you can get the swing going very high, all right? So when do you push on a swing? Right when they come up, they come to a stop, they start to move back down. So their velocity is in this direction and you push in that direction and you put a little bit of energy into the swing each time you push. And as it swings, it loses some energy, but each time it comes back, you push at just the right time and put more energy in and that energy builds up and you can get swinging at a very um, high amplitude. If you push at the wrong time though, you take energy out. If you push too soon while they're still coming up, they're going one way, you push the other, and then force times velocity is negative, you're actually taking energy out of the system. So resonance is all about pushing at the right time. So the time between your pushes needs to be the right time. If they come too soon, then you're gonna be pushing at the wrong time. If, if you, if the interval between your pushing is too short or too long, you'll be pushing at the wrong time, and sometimes you'll put energy into the system, but sometimes you'll take it out. But if you push exactly once per period, you'll always be pushing at the same point in the cycle, and you'll be putting energy in. So that's the idea with resonance. So uh, there's this thing we call the resonance frequency. That's the natural frequency that the thing wants to oscillate at. And then there's the frequency that you drive it with. And uh, if you take the difference between the two, you get what's known as the detuning. De de and you can think of the detuning in terms of angular frequency or just frequency, however you want to think about it. So here's a simulation I did of a pendulum. And I'm moving the pivot point back and forth sinusoidally, but I'm doing it at a very low frequency, well below the resonance frequency of the pendulum. And you can see the pendulum bob just follows the drive force. It just the it just mimics the the motion of the pivot. But if I move at a higher frequency, I can wiggle with a very small amplitude and I can get the ball to swing at a very high amplitude. Um, one thing you might notice is that the motion of the pivot is 45 degrees ahead of the motion of the pendulum itself. That's like when you're swinging, uh, when you're pushing someone on a swing, you, you don't push them at the point where they're moving the fastest. You push them right as they're coming to a stop, right? Just as they turn around. And uh, that's what happens, right? We saw that pushing at a low, when we're well below resonance frequency, the pendulum bobbed moved in phase with the motion of our, piv of our uh, pivot point. On resonance, the pivot point is 100, is, uh, sorry, f uh, I said 45, it's 90 degrees out of phase, all right? So on resonance, the drive is 90 degrees ahead of the response. And then when we go well above resonance, notice this is nine times the resonance frequency. And what you see is I move that pivot point back and forth and the bob just doesn't move, right? Because we're just far away from the resonance. And when you're above resonance, when you're well above resonance, the, the pendulum doesn't move. Um, if you're just a little bit above resonance, 
the pendulum will move, but it'll move not very much, and it'll be 180 degrees out of phase with the drive. We can do the same thing with springs. All right, so here is a spring, and I'm moving the top of the spring up and down. If You have to look closely to see it move. It's not moving very much. And if you look at what the mass is doing, it's also moving up and down, but not very much. That's because the resonance frequency of this mass and spring in this simulation is half a hertz, but I'm driving it at 0.45 hertz, so I'm not right at the resonance. Well, if I get closer to the resonance, then the mass starts to move more. And you can see the mass is actually moving a little bit more than the drive is moving. So we're getting, it's almost like an amplification of the drive. That the, the amount that the pendulum, sorry, that the mass on the, on the spring moves is larger than the amplitude of the drive. And if I drive right at the resonance frequency, we can really get the mass moving at a very high amplitude. It's almost hitting the floor here. All right. If we go to an even higher frequency, once again, the motion is smaller than it would have been if we were driving it at the resonance frequency. And as I mentioned, well below resonance, the drive and the motion of our uh, oscillator are in phase. On resonance, the drive is 90 degrees ahead. And when you're well above resonance, notice that the mass and the drive are 180 degrees out of phase. The drive is going up when the mass is going down. And if I go to an even higher drive frequency, the mass moves even less. And when I go to a really high drive frequency, the mass just sits there hanging as if it doesn't even know that the top of the spring is moving. So what determines how close you have to get to the resonance frequency in order to get oscillations which are much bigger than the drive? How close do you have to be to resonance for the thing to really go crazy? And how crazy is it going to go? How big will the oscillations be? It turns out it all has to do with damping. How quickly does energy leave the system? Right? So if I have a pendulum uh, or if I have a mass on a spring, there's maybe some air turbulence that's damping. Maybe the pivot on my pendulum is not perfectly frictionless. Maybe as my spring, you know, compresses and expands, there's some uh, non-conservative stuff going on. Some of that energy is being turned into heat as the, as the metal flexes and whatnot. So in every oscillating system, there's some damping. And that damping determines both how big my oscillation will get for a certain drive amplitude on resonance and how close I have to be to resonance in order to get most of that uh, oscillation. Well, here's a plot of the amplitude of oscillation as a function of frequency normalized to the resonance frequency. So, um, and these different curves are for different damping factors. So, um, this, these damping coefficients, I'm not going to really go into where they come from or what they really mean, other than bigger means more damping, okay? And if I have lots of damping, as I move, as I drive my oscillator, it kind of moves with the drive, and as I approach higher frequencies, it drops off. If I have less damping, I can start to actually get a peak, where when I get close to resonance, it starts to oscillate quite a bit, and then it drops off. If I have even less damping, I can get a big motion, a motion in, the, in this case, which is more than three times bigger than the motion of the drive. All right? As I go to even lower damping coefficients, these peaks get very narrow, that not much happens unless you're very close to the resonance. But when you're close to the resonance, the thing will move like crazy. Well, let's zoom in here. Let's zoom in on these curves. I'm plotting from zero to twice the resonance frequency. Let's go from 99% to 101% of the resonance frequency. And you can see I get these narrow curves. This blue curve here, that's the one with the least damping. That gives me the biggest amplitude for a given drive on resonance. But also, the width of this curve is narrower than the one down here that has more damping. So more damping means a broader curve. You don't have to get as close to resonance to get the maximum effect, but the maximum effect is going to be smaller. 
Now, there's a thing we call the quality factor, which is a way to um, discuss how much damping we have, how broad these resonances are. And the quality factor Q, it's basically the resonance frequency divided by the width of the curve. So if I go to the full width half maximum of this curve and I take the resonance frequency and divide by that, that gives me the Q or the quality of my oscillator. The Q is roughly the number of oscillations it takes if you're not driving it for the system to damp down to 4% of its original amplitude. Right, if there's damping in the system and I'm not driving it and I just let it go, it'll it'll damp down. And it's also related to the amount of energy stored in the system when you reach kind of your maximum amplitude of oscillation divided by the energy loss per cycle. So if you have a high Q system, you can keep driving it and it'll keep absorbing energy and absorbing energy and it'll get to a very high amplitude before you get to the point where the amount of energy you're losing per cycle is equal to what you're putting in. Right, The amount of energy you lose per cycle depends on the amplitude. So if you have a very high Q and you don't lose very much energy per cycle, you can keep putting lots of energy in until you get to a really high amplitude. Um, but you have to drive very close to the resonance frequency. So high Q means the resonances are narrow which means as, as you plot this resonance curve, it's very, very narrow. You have to be very close to the resonance frequency for much to happen. So high Q means the resonance is narrow, and it also means you can get large oscillations with a small drive. So here's some, I mean, these resonators show up all over in real life. Here's some that I've used in my research. There's a device called an electro-optic modulator where you can send a laser beam through a crystal and you can adjust the phase of the laser beam and you drive it with an electric field. You can change the optical properties of this crystal by putting a big electric field on it. Well, it turns out you need pretty big electric fields. And so in order to make the electric field bigger, you put this crystal inside of a metal resonator. And we would put little wires inside the resonator to change its volume and tune the resonator to get it right at the frequency we wanted. And then if you drive at that resonance frequency, you can get hundreds of volts across here, even though you're driving with a lot smaller uh, voltage. All right, so you can, you can get big amounts of energy stored in the resonator, which can make very large electric fields. Another thing I've used is a device called an optical cavity, which is basically just two mirrors that basically you capture laser light inside of it. And if your laser is right on resonance with one of the modes of your optical cavity, you can put light in and that it'll just keep absorbing the light and absorbing the light. Light trickles out the other side. There's maybe some absorption of light on the mirrors. But if the mirrors are very reflective, you can put lots of light in and build up really high intensities. So you can do all kinds of cool experiments where you need, you know, you've got a laser beam, but you need, you know, 100 times the intensity. So you put it into one of these build up optical cavities and hit the resonance and get really high, um, high intensities. Um, I've also worked with atomic clocks. Atomic clocks are basically resonators. All right. So you have an atom and it resonates when you hit it with certain types of laser light or microwaves. And so you can say, for example, use a microwave oscillator to tell time, right? So every, you know, 9.5 billion times my oscillator oscillates, that's one second. But in order to make sure my oscillator is stable, I lock it to an atomic resonance. You want the resonance you use in your atomic clock to be very narrow. You want your atom to have very little damping. You want it to have a long lifetime before it gives off energy. Because if you have a very narrow resonance curve, if you move off resonance a little bit, you'll notice a big change. Whereas if you have a broader resonance curve, your microwave oscillator can drift quite a bit before you notice that the atoms are not interacting with it as strongly as they were before. So there are some reasons why you would want high Q uh, types of systems. So here's just uh, an example of some things you may have dealt with in real life. An acoustic guitar strings have an Q uh, of about 10. So they'll oscillate about 10 times before they're down to about 4% of their amplitude. A trumpet, typical trumpet has a Q of about 15. A tuning fork can have a really high Q. That's why when you hit a tuning fork, it will ring for a long time. Um, they use what they call a tank circuit, an electromagnetic circuit 
which is a resonator, which, which is used then to pull out a particular frequency of radio waves when you tune your FM radio. And those tank circuits can have cues on the order of a thousand. You've heard about people singing and breaking a wine glass. Well, if you have a really high quality wine glass, it can have a quality factor of like a thousand to four thousand, which means you can put lots of energy into it and make it break because it, it's just not very damped. So you can keep putting energy in and putting energy in with each cycle and get it to oscillate a whole lot. But remember, high quality factor means big response when you drive it on resonance, but the resonance curve is narrow. So you have to sing just the right frequency to make this work. Um, all right, the sodium D resonance. So like if you shoot a laser beam at atoms or if you look at light coming from an atom, atoms act like little oscillators and they have very high quality factors. The sodium D resonance line, uh, the yellow light you see from sodium lamps, it has a quality factor of about 8.3 million. Now, if you make a good optical cavity with high quality mirrors, you can get really big buildup of intensity inside your cavity. Those cavities can have cues as high as 100 million. And if you get really, really expensive, nice mirrors, you can even get that as high as about 100 billion. Um, superconducting microwave cavities, microwave resonators that are sometimes used for different things can have quality factors as high as 100 billion. And the calcium clock transition, which has been, uh, people have done experiments with it to try and establish a new optical frequency standard, a better atomic clock, has uh, a quality, that, that transition in the atom has a quality factor of 175 billion. So that's just kind of a qualitative introduction to the idea of resonance. If I have something that undergoes harmonic motion, I can drive it and I can make really big oscillations if I drive it right on resonance and there's little damping. There's one more thing that I need you to do before we finish this video, though. If you really want to understand physics well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to focus on this pendulum. I want you to watch this pendulum move back and forth. Focus on the flashing light of the pendulum. And I want you to forget about everything except this pendulum. Don't worry about anything. All of your fears and your problems and your worries are gone. You're just focused on this pendulum and you're starting to relax. All of your muscles from your head to your shoulders, to your waist, to your knees, to your toes are relaxing and you feel like you're sinking into a cloud and every other thought is raining out of the cloud like rain. And tonight when you go to sleep, you are going to sleep deeper than you've ever slept. And when you wake up, you will be completely refreshed and all of your math and science phobias will be gone. 